Okay, good morning, everybody. I think we're live. Welcome to this week's virtual plant clinic. My name is Bill Lester. I'm with University of Florida Extension here in Hernando County. And with me today, we got a whole bunch of people on here today. We got like all the little boxes going today. Um, but my regular co-host, Lily Browning, is here. Good morning, Lily. How are you doing? I am well, Bill. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm working on well, but yes, I'm here. Get there. <laughs> I'm okay. here. That's not the best you're going to get out of me today. You're all okay. right. That's good. We're going to be talking a little bit about water today because we had a question. Was it last week or was it the week before? No, because last week was Thanksgiving, so we didn't have a plant clinic. The week before that, in the um, uh, recording on Facebook, we had a couple comments and questions about drinking water. I thought, well, I haven't had anybody on here to talk about drinking water with for a while. And Lily works for our utilities department, so she works with water. So I got Yi Lin to come back on. Yi Lin's been on here before. Good morning, Yi Lin. How you doing? Good morning, everyone. How are you all doing? Great. And Yi Lin <laughs> is our um, extension district water specialist. And I invited Gabe, who is with Marion County Extension, because the question that we got about drinking water was from somebody in Marion County. So it's great to see people listen to the virtual plant clinic and ask questions and participate from all over Florida and mm -hmm. other states sometimes, too. So I brought all the water experts on here today. So um, conservation expert. <laughs> Not, <clears throat> and they know everything about the water. So there you go. <laughs> I know how to well, save it. Well, water, you have quality, you have quantity, you have conservation, you have um, moving it from place to place. So when we get a hurricane or tropical storm, you get a lot of, you always see on TV about a, a neighborhood that got flooded out and they're pumping it here and then we pump it there and then we pump it in the river and then it goes somewhere else, it goes in the ocean. So. So it's a lot involved in, in water. So maybe sometime you can also have whoever the new water resource coordinator will be. Um, we've had the same one for many years. John Burnett is retiring and he works for the Department of Public Works. So um, whereas, you know, here at Hernando County Utilities, we love rain. <laughs> the Department of Public Works <laughs> actually, you know, uh, you know, doesn't look forward to the rainy season because then that that's when their phones start ringing and they start getting nasty calls. So the, the job over there is trying to route it into places where it should go. We, you know, turn it into drinking water. So. I know I get phone calls from people who say my neighbor did something on their property and now it's flooding my property. Come out and fix it. I'm like, well, I don't do that. <laughs> <John Burnett. laughs> he takes care of that. He'll come out and look at it and figure out. The best thing to do is if you are in, in any county, if you're considering um, buying a house or you're considering building a house, I'm here in Hernando County. You can go to the Department of Public Works, ask to see the water resource coordinator, and he will draw you. Um, he will produce a map that like it's a hundred year floodplain map. I call it a squiggly line map, but it, it's, you know, really a good part of your due diligence and it doesn't cost anything here anyway for him to do that for you to find out about the area that you're going to and make good decisions. Yeah, that reminds me of one time. It was a while back. I received a phone call. Someone said uh, his property was flooded and asked me to go there to have a look. So I got contact with the county department to just find out because the first thing to me was, okay, is is it in the flood plan? And then we checked the, the FEMA map and also checked the county map and turned out to be it was in a one in 10, like 10 year flood right, plan. Right. Yes. So basically that's why every time there was a storm, that property got flooded. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, that's very unfortunate when people and don't build rely a house on your buy a house and they don't know. Yeah. Don't rely on your realtor to divulge that into <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do your due diligence. There are resources for you. 
And then I've been told if you're out looking at a piece of property and you see a lot of bald cypresses growing on the property, probably wet. Yeah. <laughs> yep. You see cypress knees, that's a pretty good indicator. <laughs> <laughs> so with the person who made a comment and asked a question, and I went back on and answered them also. Thank you, the Elin, for a, a good, appropriate answer for him. Um, Gabe, is your guys water up there in Ocala and Marion County pretty good? And if somebody if somebody moves there because we have so many people moving to Florida and they move to Hernando County, they move to Ocala, if they move in and they don't think their water tastes right or they have questions about it, what should they do? Well, we all basically draw from the same aquifer. You know, there's different levels, um, so different water quality. Um, but generally, it's it's pretty good water here, um, in especially unique for Florida. Um, but if they have water quality questions, if, if they're in a municipality, I think I would start with my water uh, distributor or my, my service and go from there. Uh, you can usually look at an annual water quality report. And uh, so all of that is regulated by the EPA and FDEP. And so you can review that report and see what kind of contaminants there are above the MCL. Um, if there are any, which most of the time, if there are, uh, you will be notified in, in as many ways as they possibly can. Um, if anybody doesn't know, the MCL is the maximum contaminant limit. And so essentially what that is, is various contaminants over a long history have been reviewed and re-reviewed and re-reviewed. Um, to make sure that there are certain levels that they can be before they make you sick. And so they have to be below that level in your water supply before they can deliver that water to you. And so I would use um, that as your first resource. If you're on a well, um, you would definitely talk to your local extension agent um, or a water treatment specialist as well and talk to them about getting some data and so what you'd want to do is not make a decision based off of what they see. You want to make decision based off of some data collected somewhere um, and make sure it's sound data. And so certified laboratories or um, there's some mail order laboratories that use certified equipment, but they don't do it in the turnaround time that would uh, make it certified. Um, but it's still data that you can use to at least treat water. And so um, after that, once you get your data and you understand what your levels are, you can use that to work with your treatment specialist to uh, find a system that can treat water to the levels that you found in that test or that analysis, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Here in Hernando, um, with Hernando County Utilities, you may call customer service and you know request a water quality report and they'll send that to you. I, I don't know everything that happens down there below my feet <laughs> no magic. <laughs> down there, but I believe what it is, is they'll send you, you know, the latest report from your municipal well, you know, there's like five or six around the county and um, you're right. It'll talk about those different contaminants and, you know, it will let you know that they're all below, you know, what, you know, you're going to see numbers like 0. 0.00001 or something like that. And, you know, you you can get that report. That's not hard to do. And if you do have a well, um, well, you could call Bill and he'll probably talk to Yi Lin, but generally um, the health department, if you call environmental health, they, here in our county, they, um, they'll come out, I believe, and test your wells. We did have an issue, I'm going to say 20 years ago, with private well owners out in uh, a section of our county that was highly agricultural. And so um, from the, the vats that they made the cows walk through to, you know, to get rid of different um, fleas and stuff in the 40s. Arsenic. The 40s, there was arsenic, yeah, in their wells. So I know the health department was in charge of that. and. So, but I haven't heard about that in a long time. So. Yeah, and uh, I just uh, sent Bill a link because uh, earlier Gabriel was talking about drinking water standard. So there's one Edis pub. So don't ask me what Edis stand for. I can try. <laughs> Electronic. 
database information system. Yeah. Very good. That's it. <laughs> e extension for eight, nine years so still. Uh, could really say it is very well, but either way, it's an extension peer reviewed publication. And that one in the chat box uh, just lay out uh, what are drinking water standards. So, for just everything in a nutshell, for drinking water standards, there are two categories. So one is we call it primary, the other one is called a secondary. Once it's primary, it means uh, um, it has adverse health impact. And when it's secondary, oftentimes, they don't have direct adverse health impact, more like a nuisance. So for your municipalities, they follow the MCL maximum contaminant levels for primary drinking water standards. And I believe they are like 80, I may be wrong on the numbers, but a bunch like 80 parameters. And for secondary, oftentimes it's just like harness, or like iron, this kind of nuisance. So you may not, if you get water from utility, you may not get uh, these uh, parameters for secondary, but you definitely will get some critical primary drinking water standards concentrations. So if the title is called private well 101, because more it's more geared towards private wells. Uh, a little bit background to private wells. I don't know how many of you here use private wells because for public, oh, yeah, we have really here. Oh, oh, so yeah. So okay. then you know it's for private wells, they are basically no state regulations. So for public water supplies, so Gabriel mentioned for EPA Safe Drinking Water Act so regulates so like the primary drinking water standards and the secondary drinking water standard to make sure the water um, meet the limit. So consider to be safe to drink. But when it comes to private wells, it's well owner's responsibilities to make sure your well water is safe to drink. That's why we have this series of publication just uh, from what are the standards you want to follow uh, and uh, what uh, some issues may happen to your private wells. And there is a, if you go on Hernando County Government YouTube, there's a program that Bill and Lynn and I did. How long ago was that, Bill? For what? Which class? We do so many, I get them all. We did up. about water. Yeah, we've done a bunch about water. <laughs> it was, oh, it was involved. Yeah. The, the two yeah. of you, and I did a short thing on. Um, <laughs> The private owners still mm -hmm. have to follow our water restrictions, but yeah, the private well and the septic system uh, yeah. Yeah. webinar, yeah. And we have another one of those coming up for anybody watching us either live or after the fact from Fernando County on February twenty first. We are planning to have Yi Lin come to Hernando County, and we're going to have a class on wells and septic systems. So if you're on a septic system, we'll explain to you how they work and the, some of the new rules and regulations on them, which will impact you if you have to get your septic system replaced at some point. And also, well, as the importance of getting it tested and you know making sure that you're, you and your family are using clean, safe water. Gabe was just telling us he has very personal, very recent experience. In yep. That. Avenue. <laughs> yep, I just purchased a house that is buffered up to a wetland, and so our water table is quite high. And uh, so, um, in the inspection, doing my due diligence, we found that the septic tank was uh, completely well, the tank was good, but everything past that was full of sand, and so it had to get replaced. And uh, in that, the, since it was old, um, the regulations hadn't um, been put in place that the bottom of the drain field has to be two feet above the top of the water table on your property in the high season. And so, of course, uh, September, when I purchased the house, we were in the high season. The water table is about, in some areas, about six inches away from the ground surface. And so uh, we had to move the drain field location. So the septic tank is now going to be moved um, out of the drain of the back of my house. Then another chamber is going to be added to that where the effluent 
moves after it moves through filters, the sediment or not sediment, but material stays behind and the liquid flows through a filter into a third tank or a second tank. And then that gets pumped up front uh, uh, to the front of my property where it's a little bit higher above grade. And then we have to bring in clean fill. The drain fill has to be put on the top of that and then buried so that we have that two feet between the bottom of the septic or the bottom of the drain field and the top of the water table. And so, like I mentioned, though, this isn't a nitrogen or not a nitrogen reducing system, it's still quite expensive to get done. Um, so again, if you're buying a house, do your due diligence, know where your water table's at, make sure that septic system's functioning and uh, talk to your, the seller's agent about making sure that uh, it gets pumped and then on that note for wells, make sure that you can get as much information on a private well as possible before you purchase the house. Try to get uh, last time it was maintenance, how frequently it was maintenance, what kind of pump is in there, how deep is the pump, how deep is the well. Um, all that stuff can help you out a lot when it comes to maintenance mm -hmm. and treatment. Yes, we still do have a lot of um, wells. I think any any new community that's being built, you know, of any certain size from now on in Hernando County, it will be on municipal water and sewer, you know, without a question. But if the property, I think is bigger than an acre. Mm -hmm. That's um, the BMAP, BMAP yeah. language. <laughs> so, yeah, we. Uh, I just happen to live, you know, out of the municipal <laughs> system. Bill lives in it you have municipal water but you still have a septic tank correct correct we still have septic but i'm on um Hernando county water and you're and not I'm, you're not I'm, in the um the i just lost the word you know the the area that is um the, the BMAP. Area, not the bmap the other um, pfa priority focus area yeah, the PFA. Yeah, I'm, PFA. I'm in the priority focus area and we also own a house in deltona over in volusia county and it has set <laughs> priority focus area also good now, picks what we're talking about with this primary focus area we're talking about sensitive areas that affect local springs so you know it's going to be a slow process but we have there's primary focus area in Spring Hill, and we start, you know, those who are involved already know, <laughs> you know, that we're starting with them and um, undergoing a septic to sewer um, program. So I really don't know much about it at all. I know that, you know, the people have been notified and that we've had public meetings about it. And um, there is, you know, uh, there is a cost for them, but they can, you um, uh, put it on their taxes over, you know, like a decade or something to kind of break it up. And why we're doing this is because, well, here in Hernando County, we have the largest concentration of springs in the world. Did you know that, Bill? Like, yes, I did. Yeah. And, you know, we, we have to protect those springs. And there are many ways that nitrates are entering our Wikiwachi River, as well as the other areas. Um, and they've been identified as over fertilization and faulty septic tanks. So I, you know, I wouldn't mind at all being attached to a sewer system, but I am not in the PFA, not for the Wikiwachi at all. I'm actually for the Chazowitzka, but it's, it's, my area is not, you know, that primary focus area right now. I don't think it'll happen in my lifetime. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I guess the takeaway message is that at least here in Hernando County, bit by bit, they're moving in the direction of putting more people on sewer and having fewer people on septic. And they're starting with the most, you know, egregious one. If you live right along a river, and I, I see pictures and I've heard stories about really, really old septic systems like. Oh, yeah. If you have a little old house that was built in the 50s or 60s right next to a river or something your septic may be like butting right up against the, the creek bank and all kinds of horror stories about stuff going in the water you know they're going to get rid of those first mm -hmm. well, yeah i can 
tell you some horror stories. We moved here when I was 11 to Hernando County. My mother bought this little tiny house and the septic tank, it already wasn't working. And it was, I mean, within feet of the house. And I do remember them digging it up and I swear it was only about the size of a cooler. <laughs> I remember being 11 years old and seeing that and they bumped the lid or something, just roaches <laughs> scattering uh. everywhere. <laughs> this is getting worse and worse, isn't it? And we got a new well and septic you know, much further out in the yard. So, you know, that worked for the whole 22 years or whatever that my mother, you know, lived there. And um, yeah, that we, so we got to know the well driller and the, the septic guy, like the first people we met here in Florida. <laughs> fast forward many, many years to a house that I bought like 14 years ago, totally different part of the county. And I'm like, okay, I have a well again. <laughs> Look at the well, what name is on it, except that same name. <laughs> I mean, it's his son, but it's still the same company that from the first people we met in 1978. So, wow, cool. I was like, well, I know I can trust this well. <laughs> so, doing business. It seems like every area has the well services that have been there for generations. Mm -hmm. And I mean, they, they dig well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. They dig well, yes. <laughs> And a little bit back, and because we were on the subject, has just reminded me earlier. Gabriel mentioned uh, maintain that uh, two feet, uh, twenty-four inch setback from your the bottom of drain field to the top of the highest water table. That's the latest code. I, I forgot the time, but I I really forgot the timeline. But code before was like from six inch to twelve inch and the 18 inch, and the now it's to 24 inch. So in other words, if your house is quite old, highly like, uh, that your house is old, highly likely your dream field is old. And when your dream field is old, it may be really close uh, to the top of the water table. Because I think it was after Hurricane Ian in Seminole County of that region. I heard from the other agent, because uh, uh, the septic system there, were, they, they were fairly old. So the setback didn't meet the 24 inch and with the flooding actually, because the just the flooding was quite awful after Hurricane mm -hmm. Ian. So most of the septic systems and the dream field, the actress dream field, most of dream field, they were underwater. So it caused a lot of issues. And those um, who have to, who are in our primary focus area, who um, are going to sewer from septic um, if you think about it and your house is older and you have to replace your septic system and, you know, the rules are now um, if you're on less than an acre, you do have to put on in the nitrate reducing septic tank to help our springs. That eventual cost is going to cost a whole lot more <laughs> than mm -hmm. the cost that it, you know, is to participate in the septic to sewer system yeah. way more <laughs> so you know it's kind of, it's kind of kind of good news yeah, yeah and transferring to sewer i think is probably better anyways because uh you don't have that equipment on site that you have to maintenance for the next 25 years right. you know right. you're connected to sewer and it's just a pipe going from your house to the plant right. and so uh past your property they're going to maintain it it's not something you have to worry about mm -hmm. and uh, otherwise these other systems have a lot of moving parts there's pumps there's aerators and things like that and uh, you never know if you bought the house and you don't know where all the lines are and you have heavy equipment or tree work or something like that being done and they drive over that your drain field sure. or any of your equipment or drain lines uh, you could end up causing an issue and so um, set sewer also treats better um, well <laughs> I don't want to say that yet but uh, there is a lot of really great treatment at, at sewer or wastewater facilities so if you have the options, definitely go that route. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because uh, if it's a conventional system, just like most of us, if you are a septic system, it's a conventional system. Ideally, everything works well. The nitrogen removal, according to research, it's about 30%. Because septic systems, they, they are not designed to remove for nutrients. The no. primary goal for septic system is septic. So it's kill bacteria. 
So a functional septic system should be good at a passenger removal, but not as a nitrogen removal. But if your system fails, even the primary goal just to kill bacteria may be infected too. Right. Yeah, the septic systems are created for public health. Mm -hmm. You know, that's why yeah. they're used. And they do a great job at that, you know, much better than 400 years ago in Paris, you know, just down the gutter. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you just open your window and throw the bucket of. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, that didn't work really well. No. And <laughs> one thing I've learned that was shocking to me <laughs> because I've been here in Florida, you know, 44 years, 45, whatever it is. Um, other states, including Pennsylvania, where I have a lot of family, if you need your septic tank, um, you know, pumped, uh, you are responsible for digging it up, you know, to to the access point for the the guys to come out. They do no digging whatsoever. Oh God, I wouldn't like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, especially in Pennsylvania, that's solid yeah, soil. Yeah, exactly. I'm paying them to do. When my yeah. sister had to have that done, I'm like, what do you mean you have to do it? And she had to have her grandson come out, and and she's like, well, what do you mean? What you know? That's like regular routine. Like, are we gonna have to dig out our own septic tank in Florida? Yeah. But, I would dig that out one time, and after that, I'd put a manhole on it, and it'd be yeah. forever accessible. <laughs> yeah, but I, you know, hey, I do have that white cap thing. I guess they just put it really in there. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. For anybody watching, if you guys have any lawn and garden kind of questions, water questions, anything, comments, whatever it might be, just go ahead and uh, uh, put them in the chat. And... <laughs> Of course, Buddy comes up with a comment immediately. Well, just why did he say that, Bill? Hey. Bill, <laughs> tell our guests why he said that. <laughs> because Bill's answer to everything, insects, weeds, whatever, is to throw it over the fence to the neighbor's <laughs> yard. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you have a plant and you have a lover grasshopper or one or two caterpillars or a little problem like that, just put, pick it off and throw it over the fence. Problem solved. <laughs> <laughs> Spray chemicals, you don't have to spend all your time and energy mixing them up, going out there and spraying them. If it's just a little problem, throw it over the fence in your neighbor's yard and your problem is solved. Because <laughs> caterpillars won't magically fly back to your plant if you throw them over the fence. The so. moral of that lesson is never live next to your lester. <laughs> don't be throwing stuff over the fence. Your neighbor definitely won't like that one. Buddy is one of our regular listeners from Leon County. So we got people from all over. <laughs> yes. And, and I, I, wanted to to go, I put a link to, and I'll go ahead and dig that up and put that in again. Um, if everybody watching this, either live or recorded, can go ahead and take our very, very short, painless five question survey. That would be great. Only take it once. So if you've already taken it in the past, don't take it again. Let me go ahead and put that. It's just like when you have to pay, you know, at the restaurant and you use the little thing on the table and then you have to do the survey after. <laughs> it's a great bill as you would your waiter. <laughs> I do have a question for you, Bill. So I have a landscape question. I don't think I can throw out of, over the fence. <laughs> so I already turned off my irrigation system. I still have the mushrooms pop up everywhere. <laughs> so what should I do? Just leave it there? It just That's good, healthy soil, yeah. It is. It's, yeah. it's a natural part of the you know natural environment outside. Do not eat so that. Obviously, you have decent soil, you have organic material in your soil, and it, it could be <clears throat> old tree roots or tree branches or two by fours when they built your house that the fungi are growing in mm -hmm. and then certain times of the year they get triggered to make mushrooms that's how they reproduce we tend to have more mushrooms during the winter when it's gotcha. a little bit cooler and if we have a fairly wet winter you're going to get more mushrooms and it's been i mean we haven't gotten a lot of rain but we've gotten some it's yeah. all dry I was gone for the week of Thanksgiving and I came back to some mushrooms in my 
wildflower bed, which kind of surprised me because I live in a very, very dry area. But the area that I was watering, hand watering and rain barrel watering, was that bed. So. Yeah, I have like the backyard. It's all the orange mushroom, super tiny. Of course, still white mushrooms in the front yard, like everywhere. The fairy house is everywhere. Uh -huh. So you walk around and you just see my yard and all my, all my neighbors, super pretty green yard. <laughs> and I have the mushroom yard. <laughs> Mushrooms don't hurt anything. They don't hurt your lawn. They don't hurt the grass. Don't eat them. Don't eat the wild mushrooms in Florida because we have so many species here. It's almost impossible to say 100% for sure they're not poisonous. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of lookalikes too. Well, go out and pick wild mushrooms and eat them. You can do that up north where they have like five species of mushrooms. But here in Florida, we just have so many that... And don't send me pictures asking, can I pick this and eat it? Because I'm going to tell you, yeah. I'll know what it is, but don't eat it. So. Yes. Um, and, and yeah, the grocery store has plenty of mushrooms for you to eat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, that I love mushrooms. And that's where my mushrooms come from is the grocery store. So Glenda emailed me earlier this morning a question about blackberries. So let me go ahead and find it and look at my email here. Uh, so Glenda obviously took part in our class last year on blackberries and got some Osage blackberry plants. And she says they put out a lot of foliage, but no fruit, too much nitrogen. And when it's the best time to take cuttings. <clears throat> so with blackberries, they flower in the spring. So they should not be flowering now. If they're growing, if they're putting out a lot of foliage, that's great. If they're getting bigger and stronger they're gonna have more branches to flower on and get fruit on but they're not going to flower until spring they flower after the blueberries which would yeah, be yeah i'm thinking may yeah may may ish mm -hmm. because really they <laughs> harvest them after because the way it goes is they grow strawberries during the winter when the strawberries are done it's time for blueberries when the blueberries are done they pick the blackberries mm -hmm. So they should not be flowering now. You should not have blackberries on them now. If they look otherwise healthy and they're getting bigger, that's great. Now you're going to have nice big plants that will hopefully flower in the spring and get blackberries on. So you're fine. You're good. Were those thornless blackberries that you gave? Do what? Were they thornless? Yes, they were thornless. <laughs> yeah, we didn't give out the thorny blackberries. <laughs> thorny and lee has a lot of mushrooms also lee's down in broward county yes one no. of our regulars she's either broward or brevard i never remember <laughs> i think broward you know we've been doing this for about two and a half years this coming april will be our three-year anniversary wow with the virtual plant clinic april That's 1st our, our, the anniversary is april 1st <laughs> Yes, it is. Yeah, it's <laughs> April Fool's Day. <laughs> That's. I'm funny. already thinking about what we're going to do for that episode. And I've already, I wanted to point out that it took us 13 minutes in when we started talking about septic. So we cannot get through one of these without having some discussion, some poo-related discussion in some way. <laughs> so. It's all for the soil. Yes, it is. And Glenda asked about when she could take cuttings off those blackberries. Pretty much any time of year, you could try taking cuttings. Uh, you're going to have the best luck probably in the summer off the new spring growth that's gotten just a bit hardened off. So early to late summer, taking cuttings right now in winter when you're not growing a whole lot, you're not... They're not getting a lot of new branches on there may not be as successful but what i've always done with cuttings is I, I take a bunch i take a whole bunch i hedge my bets and if i take 100 cuttings i know i'm going to get at least one that's going to survive <laughs> sometimes they get 99 so you never know but you should take cuttings right now how big should the plant be before you start taking cuttings from it 
well, obviously, if it's just a teeny tiny little plant, you take a cutting and now you have no plant left. That's not a good idea. I know mm -hmm. I have some in my backyard. <coughs> They've gotten about, for me, knee high, between knee high and waist high. So I could take cuttings off of mine. Okay. You can also try taking, um, I think it's called tip cuttings, because with blackberries, the branches, it grows up and then it kind of flop. Take one of those branches that's flopping and kind of pin it to the soil, put a little bit of dirt on top of it, and it will sprout roots. And after it gets roots, you can snip it off and you have a whole new blackberry. Yeah, I was gonna say, you're creating a thicket up there. Yeah. I guess that's what they would do in the wild. Depending on how you have them planted, they'll grow a bit and spread a bit and create a thicket, a, a mm -hmm. patch, a blackberry patch, without the thorns. Well, now we have Bassam, Bassam interested in the blackberries. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what is the best soil media to plant the cuttings? Uh, a high quality potting soil would work just fine. Uh, seed starting mix works just fine also. That tends to be kind of expensive. It comes in small bags and goodness knows everything's expensive nowadays. Nothing's cheap. It's not dirt cheap. Mm -hmm. But just a, a high quality potting soil. If you buy the cheap potting soil and the potting soil inside the bag has gotten wet because it sits outside at the big box store and you take it home and it weighs 150 pounds, you open it up. It stinks. It stinks like a septic system. <laughs> it's probably not going to be the best soil to be growing. <laughs> so that's why we always tell people get the quality potting soil, not necessarily the ninety-nine cent a bag stuff. Or you can use it to cover up your drain field. <laughs> they have to say if your septic system smell really bad, that's not a functional system. A functional one shouldn't be too bad because it's septic. So it not just kill the bacteria, also should eliminate or reduce the odor. So have, when, yeah, when you smell something, so that's the time to check your septic system. Septic it's system yeah. is on anaerobic. Something? Oh, yeah. that's, that's not a, that's a bad sign. Septic system um, is, uh, relies on anaerobic bacteria. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Whereas our compost piles, we want aerobic bacteria. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And also some temperature to heat yeah. it up. Yes. And anaerobic bacteria break stuff down. It just, they do it real slowly and they give off a lot of stinky things while they're doing it. Plus, mm -hmm. the contents of your septic system are stinky to begin with. <laughs> so, <laughs> pretty stinky proposition. <laughs> <laughs> So Iraq e has a question here. Iraq e has woolly apple aphids on their Anna apple roots. Any organic solutions or non-organic? This is gonna be interesting. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. Let me let me think for a moment. <laughs> uh, uh, Bill is not a huge fan of trying to grow apples in Florida. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so Iraq, e number one, where do you live? If, if, if e Rock is, is in Ohio for some reason, that's very, very different than here in Hernando County. Um, Woolly apple aphids, I'm not all that familiar with dealing with them. There are a few varieties. Anna is one of them. There's Anna and like two other varieties of apples that are low chill apples and can grow here in Florida. They generally don't do really well though. I've never, I've known very, very few people that actually get worthwhile apple harvests off of them. So even though in theory they grow, in practicality, they don't grow well. If, what, if your goal is to get a bunch of apples, you're probably not going to hit your goal. So if you have Anna apples, um, with woolly apple aphids, um, do, they, do they attack the upper part of the plant or are they just um, uh, feeding straight on the roots? Because if they are feeding straight yeah, then he's on, asking you, Dave. It's on organic kind mm -hmm. of control. He's in St. Augustine. St. Augustine. And Dorset. Yeah. That's a type of apple. I haven't heard of 
woolly apple aphids, but I'm not that much into, you know, practical plants <laughs> that you can eat. <laughs> There are woolly aphids. I, I very, very rarely see them in real life. And they're aphids, and they're like white and fluffy like a mealybug. So picture an aphid that looks like a mealybug, kind of. And okay. if they're... Oh. So to control them on the branches, insecticidal soap a couple times will work just fine. If they are feeding on the roots, you're probably going to have to use some, something systemic which is not going to be organic. There's no organic systemic pesticides for that. So, E-Rock, if you what want to- some kind of fish oil or something that they would use on the sago palms? Is that not, you should, can you use that on edible type things? Dinotefuran, I don't know if that's labeled for edibles. It's labeled for ornamentals. That's what you use on sagos. And it is systemic. So if you want to shoot me an email, I'll go ahead and look up what kind of non-organic systemic things are labeled for that. Because you have to use the pesticide that's labeled for the type of plant that you're using. And if you're if we're talking edibles, you need to be extra careful. You know, mm -hmm. if it was a rose bush, you're not eating the rose bush. So you want to use something that's gonna work for roses. But you don't have to worry about health concerns or anything. Yeah, I remember when the sago palms were full of all those Asian cycad scales, people were using fish oil, um, like drenches on the roots, and even some like sesame seed oil drenches. But you would have to check, of course, the label. And I know those who were using the fish oil, they told you wear clothes that you never want to, that you're willing to throw away. <laughs> and, you know, because it was going to be a, a smelly proposition as well. Well, horticultural oil works just fine on those scales that are above ground. Mm -hmm. If you have some kind of scale or woolly aphid that's feeding on the roots below ground, how do you spray and actually hit them when they're living below ground? So, short of digging up your plant and shaking off all the soil and spraying it, which is probably not going to do the plant a whole lot of good. Um, yeah. You're going to have to use something systemic that's going to go into the plant, into the roots. Now, when the insects feed on it, they're going to get a mouthful of the insecticide and it's going to kill them and your problems hopefully solved. So if we have anybody who's either watching us live or if you watch this recorded, and you know, we have a lot of views on this every week recorded. It is recorded and saved on Facebook, on our Facebook group, on YouTube also. So if you're watching this after the fact and you have any questions about well water, septics, you're worried about maybe your well water isn't really safe, how do you find out, there's Yilin's email. So go ahead, you can go ahead and shoot her an email or me. I'll keep showing all the different emails on here for a bit. And <laughs> I'm recycling yes. a McDonald's cup and it has Hernando County Utilities water. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, Hernando County has some really good water. We moved here from Volusia County. Deltona has terrible water. It's like drinking a bottle of bleach. Ew. Yeah, it's. We no, have been several years, but. System. It's been several years, but we won taste tests oh. of yeah. our water. Blind taste tests. Like yeah. Can you imagine being those judges drinking water, mm -hmm. <laughs> judging the different tastes, and we won. <laughs> but if you're unhappy with your Hernando County water, just shoot Lily an email, and she'll get right on it. Uh, <laughs> I will find someone to send it to, yes. <laughs> I'm surprised we didn't get any softener questions. That's usually when I have a water treatment class, that is the first thing. And that's the last thing we talk about. And it's 20, 25 minutes. Yeah. And uh, so, but um, yeah. they're happy with their water. That's the best, right? <laughs> <laughs> yep. That's good. Good news. What, what is your opinion of water softeners? Ooh, um, I can't, I don't want to take a, an opinion place with them. I'd say there's benefits and drawbacks to both. Um, you know, there's, there's some savings in terms of 
soap costs and skin and hair and uh, soap scum building up on your shower, those sorts of things. But there's also costs uh, with the softener, like maintenance, salt that's added, um, maintenance in terms of not just normal maintenance, but if a pump or a valve goes out. And then also you have to think about when it regenerates the it's filter not. media. It's, uh, I believe, Elin, correct me if I'm wrong, sometimes a 30 to 40 gallon regeneration process mm -hmm. that doesn't go into your house for drinking or use. It just regenerates that filter media and then gets dumped somewhere else. And mm -hmm. so if you have municipal water, you're paying for it and it kicks on in the middle of the night to regenerate itself, you're going to uh, increase your monthly water bill. Um, actually, if it, if it regenerates once a week, you could do four times three is 120 gallons uh, up to uh, 120 gallons a month of mm -hmm. water that you're going to pay for just to regenerate that system. So um, there's, there's benefits and drawbacks. And I know some utilities, some, not a handful of utilities, as far as I know, they don't take a uh, discharge. So it's just a water softener when you discharge or uh, recharge because it's very dense and uh, you need to discharge it. And the sewer system is just like, it's so dense, I cannot take it. Mm. Too much salt, yeah. Mm -hmm. Here, going back to uh, the apples and the woolly aphids, E-Rock emailed me a picture. So let me go ahead and share that. We can look in the old email here. So that's a picture of the roots and those are woolly apple aphids on there. So, Iraq, I'll look into that, and I'll get an answer to you. Now that I have your email, I'll, I'll, I'll email you back. I, we don't normal. I don't normally run across that past. They want to know why, why, why you feel apples are hard to grow in Florida. Couple reasons, even though the Anna Dorset, and there's at least one other variety that are low chill. They tend to need more chill than what we actually get. Um, I've been told that they, the do, they do well up in the panhandle because they get enough chill. We don't get a whole lot of chill here. Right. Well, this E is in St. Augustine. Um, it's humid, though. It's so humid. It's part of the issue. A lot of these these um, apples that they're offering, you know, with the low chew hours, where are they from, Bill? Oh, they tend to be from, well, one variety is from Israel. Right. Um, in our environment. a desert. <laughs> we are not a desert, you know. So. And another major problem with them is during the summer, they always get eaten up with leaf spot fungus. So the leaves are going to get brown and black spots on them. The leaves are going to fall off. If you are diligent with using a fungicide on them, you can keep the leaves on and reduce the amount of fungal problems you have. But what happens is with any tree, if it gets a fungus during the summer and the leaves fall off early, a month or two early, over a couple of years, the tree is going to get weaker and weaker and weaker. It doesn't die right away. So a lot of times, like um, if you have a deciduous tree and the leaves, figs, figs lose their leaves in the winter naturally but they always get a fungus, so they usually lose their leaves a month or two early. If you let that happen a couple of years in a row, the tree's gonna get weaker, and that makes it harder to get a good crop. And then a lot of times, if you do get apples, they tend to only size up to be about the size of crab apples. Mm -hmm. so if you're expecting the same kind of apples that you buy at the grocery store that grow out in Oregon and Washington State up at really high elevations, it's not gonna happen here in Florida. You could make some cider with your crab apples, though. Yeah, 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 you could do that. Mm -hmm. Bill, do you think uh, soil solarization might help E-Rock as long as he did it in a way that didn't hurt the plant but could still get rid of those pests at the root zone? Maybe an organic method? Are you there, Bill, or are you frozen? I think he's I frozen think and he thinking. Yeah. Oh, uh, he's thinking and, oh, okay, he is moving. All right. <laughs> he might be highly medicated, so this could be. 
Yeah. Oh, yep. There he goes. Um, good question. <laughs> How would you go about solarizing the soil? You know, what would you do? Put plastic around the roots, or what that's what do? I was thinking. Yeah, um, get a moisture down. You know, irrigate it like you normally would, um, and then put like get uh, painters plastic from a box store and put a couple layers of that down, make sure it's sealed good around it and just leave the base of the plant exposed and then put some bricks or something down and let it get hot. Um, and I'm curious, maybe Bill can chime in on this when he comes back. Uh, would that kill the pests? And, and maybe if the apple tree's resilient enough, it might bounce back um, right. with the heated soil, um, but some of the pests might not be able to. What time of year would you do that? Anytime. Probably summer. Yeah, yeah, summer would be best time or spring. I mean, here in Florida, there's only a short period when it's really that cold. Mm -hmm. um, so I think midday, you could probably do it and uh, let it go a few weeks. But um, a few weeks. Okay. Yeah. But you don't think it'll like harm the roots getting them? That's a question for Bill. I'm not sure. I don't know how resilient they are. And he might say, try it <laughs> but uh don't expect the plant to make it through i'm, I'm not too sure yeah that's what i'm thinking it's a you raise up the temperature of your soil to what degree like a couple like, i think it's over 100 it's 120 or so so i think it um, yeah I, it, i'm not sure about roots that's what i'm saying i that's, that's kind of where i'm at yeah <laughs> just thinking of an organic method that maybe the plant could live through and other things won't Definitely might not be comfortable for it, but uh, it might be a way to do it, it without. Might be a way if it's already being uh, destroyed anyway. So mm -hmm. um, I just lost those. Oh, there also may be, um, well, he knows he has the, he or she, I don't know, he, they know that they have the, um, those sure. aphids. But if they, another problem in Florida is we do have a lot of cedar trees and you may wonder why did i go there <laughs> it's the cedar cedar apple rust that um it needs both of those type of trees to create this this disease called cedar apple rust and that you know a lot of apple orchards um, professional ones make sure there aren't any cedar trees around bill we have a question for you since you decided to come back yeah my internet crashed <laughs> oh no um if we if they do the solarization of the roots like putting plastic you know film down around the roots itself to try and kill those uh aphids how is tells of that adverse would it adversely affect the roots by getting too hot yes if you get it hot enough to kill the aphids it's going to damage the tree roots so that wouldn't be a good idea gotcha Cool. Oh, they say it's in a pot. Why don't you just repot it then? <laughs> you know, you know, just start with all new soil and repot it. What do you think of that? If it's a tree, yeah. I might assume it's a big, big pot. Right. Yeah, and so. you can buy very large pots now, and you can grow small fruit trees in them. Okay. Um, or if you repot it, you're still going to have the aphids potentially on the roots. That's true. What you're going to have to do is use some kind of systemic pest control. Okay. So especially in a pot, trying to solarize it, it probably would get the roots too too hot, do you think? Mm -hmm. But for right now, um, just using insecticidal soap to knock down the above ground ones because there were some on the branches and leaves and to get the ones that are on the roots above the ground would definitely help. Is there some kind of soil? Can you use that same stuff as a soil drench to try and get in there? You could, I'm not sure if insecticidal soap was really labeled to be used as a drench. Oh, okay. You could try it. It would not kill the tree. <laughs> you guys, <coughs> you guys are asking me all the hard questions today. Uh -huh. But then again, you can just hand pick them and throw them over the fence. There you go. They probably won't throw far. <laughs> They're very little. 
The, the fed starts well for rubber grasshoppers when they get really, really big. My wife starts screaming, ah, I get rid of that grasshopper. I just get it off the photo. <laughs> I have a question because earlier we were talking about the apple. So if it's bad, your apples won't be like bad soil. Or it's not healthy tree. The apples won't be too big. Just part of my question. It's uh, I start to grow tomatoes, uh, and my in-law gave me the plants. They're supposed to be giant tomatoes. Okay, not necessarily giant, but big tomatoes. Oh. Turned out to be I have two pots of cherry tomatoes. They just oh. never grow bigger. I have no idea what happened. Did they get ripe where you could eat them or they just mm -hmm. got green? Oh, well, cherry tomatoes are great. Yeah, yeah. They're yeah. regular beef potato, uh, no, beef tomato shapes, everything. They uh -huh. just never grow bigger. Just like they're only just tiny and stop growing and all red, all ready to eat. I'm just curious. I still eat yeah. it. It tastes great. Mm. <laughs> I want to know why they don't grow bigger. Well, big beef steaks and stuff don't do that great here, do they, Bill? No, because they take a real long time to grow. So if you grow them up north, they grow all summer long. Here, you can grow them twice a year, but each time period is reasonably short. Gotcha. So, like, I'm going to start my tomatoes, my tomato seeds pretty soon because I want to start them really early this year and get nice big transplants. And when I put them out, in the end of february beginning of march um they need to be done by june so they don't the, the problem is the beefsteak tomatoes will take 100 days from a couple month old transplants to grow and our tomato season just isn't that long Got you. but i only grow cherry tomatoes and roma tomatoes because they grow fast and they'll give you a lot of tomatoes mm -hmm. and they can actually push a little further into you know the summer the the cherry tomatoes and stuff usually yeah. by june by june your tomatoes are done here and that's something that transplant people transplants um have a hard time getting in their minds because they think memorial day i'm going to plant my tomatoes oh no they're wrapping up and being done <laughs> by then yeah because up north you put them in the ground in may and they grow all summer and you get your big crop in August, September, I guess. August, really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's just yeah. the heat. Mm -hmm. Yes. And we're getting close to the time to wrap this up. But we got a question from Glenda here. She has little moths invading her house. They might be about a third of an inch. Any idea how to control them? Clean out your pantry. Throw everything away. <laughs> <laughs> one of a bunch of different things it could be something that's just outside and you have a lot of them in your neighborhood and they're trying to get in or they're successfully getting in it could be um pantry moths like lily said you might have uh infested beans or rice or dog food or something like that and they've Nothing grown up cereal flour all those grains um rice. And it's, it's not anything you did it happens to everyone, you know, at some point in their life. They're, they're just, these eggs just exist in these grain foods. So I would, you know, look in the pantry, see if you see any extra activity in there. Um, throw everything away, kind of clean the shelves with branches or with branches, with <laughs> water and, you know, start again. And you might want to start to keep some of that. Um, material in your freezer for a little bit. Sometimes people put flour and other stuff in their freezer. Well, you can start with just going through the pantry and looking real closely to see if there's anything that has bugs in it, a lot of moths, if that's where they're coming from. Uh, we see a lot of people who get drain, drain flies and drain moths, and they'll reproduce in your drain because when the water goes down the drain, it doesn't just go straight down, it goes into a P-trap, it curves, and it'll get some ooky stuff in there. And the uh, uh, flies or moths will actually feed on that and breed yeah. on it, and go flying out of your drain. And if you she think about- probably water, refer to those as flies or gnats. If she's mm -hmm. seeing what she thinks are moths, I'm really thinking we're going with pantry pests here. There I are great Look in the cat food, look in the dog food, look in cereal. There's, you know, all kinds of secret places. 
it you know, you can very easily find out if it's any kind of drain issue. Before you go to bed, take a glass and put it over the drain in, in, in all your different drains, you know, the bathroom, the kitchen, bathtub, everything. Then the next morning, look, if there's anything flying around inside that glass, that's where something is coming from. So, and there's ways to get rid of them pretty easily. You have to get a special pesticide that's like the consistency of pancake syrup and it oozes down the pipes oh my and kills everything that might be living in those pipes down there. I, yeah, um, yeah, boiling water doesn't really work. <laughs> no, because really boiling water and bleach doesn't coat the entire pipe as it goes down and curves and comes up. So Maggie says, is this a program that's regularly scheduled so I can make sure I don't miss it? Did you pay her to put yes, that on? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it definitely is. And I'll go ahead and scroll the easiest way to keep on top of when we're doing next week's virtual plant clinic, or Lily's doing a class, or I'm doing a class, or Elin's coming to town and we're talking about septic systems and um, uh, well water. If you just go to HernandoExtension.com, that has a listing of all of our different upcoming events and exactly how to log on, whether it's in person, online, Facebook Live, Zoom. We do stuff a lot of different ways, so you really have to make sure that you're logging on or finding it correctly to be able to join in. But yeah, we're going to be here today. As you mentioned earlier, you, you can watch this pre-recorded, or not, yeah, recorded, not pre-recorded, on Facebook, on YouTube. There's pod. You put it on some podcasts, don't you? Yes, uh, I take the audio from this and put it on a podcast. So, because with StreamYard, it records all this, and I can download the entire recording or just the audio. And it, it's very nice because it does that for me. The audio file from Zoom is worthless. It's in a weird format that I don't know what to do with. So well, speaking of Zoom, um, as of two minutes ago, my 97th YouTube video just hit um, Hernando County Government YouTube. So if you want to go back and if you didn't get to watch with me yesterday live, it is Florida Friendly Gardening for the part-time gardener on Hernando County Government YouTube. If you know of anyone who wants to uh, look into that, um, they've changed their URL, um, Bill. I'm sure that one still works, but they made a friendlier, even a friendlier looking one. Oh, um, okay. so well, you can go to YouTube stuff. and just use the search box up on the top sure. and look up Hernando County Government. That's how I find Right, but make sure you put government in there. And the Florida Friendly Landscaping Playlist like I said, there's there's a rabbit hole you can fall down. <laughs> so, and if you know someone who wants to hear about Florida Friendly Landscaping for the part-time resident who does not want to even do YouTube, I know a lot of people will do YouTube who won't do Facebook or anything. They don't want to do anything like that. I have it coming up uh, sometime. <laughs> it's the Spring Hill Library. Oh, in January, the, the second Wednesday in January, um, I'll be presenting it live in person at the Spring Hill Library. So. And can I promote one? Since we are on the YouTube, just occurred to me, there are a group of agents in Central District uh, and develop 11 hands-on videos on tips to create your Florida-friendly landscape. So they are very short. Gabriel is one of our speaker here. Mm -hmm. she, he did a, a very long video. The <laughs> only one who did a very long video, not that long, 20 minutes. I'm just joking. So that's the only way it's 20 minutes, but really like step by step, how you can build a ring barrel. And I have some other videos. They just how to set up a ring gauge. It's only one minute. Oh, uh, how yes. to design a ring garden. Because to me, it's a, if we go back to how to set up a ring gauge, I find a lot of interesting ring gauges. However, either it's the ring gauge itself has a cover. So I'm yes. like, it's so pretty, but 
your cover block the yeah, railing. Yeah, like the little frog with the umbrella. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. All the interesting, like to me, it's just so simple. Like you, you have your rain gauge, so you know how much rain you get. But mm -hmm. if you don't do it properly, then your rain gauge is basically useless. So we have eleven videos. Uh, both oh, 10 of them are very short like i said no more than 10 minutes so i'm slowly working on trying to get what i call florida friendly fast classes that are mm -hmm. like bill's gone again <laughs> <laughs> 20 minutes or, or 15 minutes or less but yeah most of my classes are you gotta listen to me for about an hour or so or scroll through it and just mm -hmm. get what you want <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, this is because uh, we did a Water Wednesday workshop. We we did a Water Wednesday webinar. At one point, we got a survey results in, and they said that they really want to do yeah, something. Sure. Yeah, and, and they want the in-person. So during that in-person event, uh, IFS Communication came and developed all these short videos. And for us, it's, uh, yeah, just right on to the point, know how to do it. And also, it can be a source for other agents if they are teaching, and yeah. they cannot do hands out. Oh, I steal from me. everyone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now you can steal from us. I just put it in the comments. So, Bill, if you can make it uh, to the comment, I will appreciate that. Okay. I don't see it in private chat. Oh, I let me get, do that again. I keep getting kicked off today for some reason. Me too. Yeah, this reminds me of when um, Bill was not able to be at one of these and a master gardener and I were doing it and I was kicked off for like seven or eight minutes and Bernie never lost a beat. He just kept on going. He was <laughs> big time. I think he preferred me not being there. <laughs> Lily, we have a question here for you. Uh, yes, we do. Do you present videos to inform people how to garden for butterflies? Yes. As I'm sure you know, they're very important for pollinating our ornamental flowers and vegetables. If you go to Hernando County Government YouTube, I have many pollinator classes. Um, you know, there's just look at the different titles. It'll talk about birds, bees, and butterflies or uh, pollinator gardening. I probably have five or six different things on there. What I just mentioned to the folks who were watching the uh, Florida Friendly Landscaping for the Part-Time Gardener is, you know, in Central and North Florida, now is not the time to be focusing on butterflies. You know, especially the monarchs, once it's hitting below 52, 55, they, you know, it is detrimental to their health. So I tell the seasonal residents that you can have your beautiful butterfly gardens in, in your northern place wherever you are in the summer and i'm not saying you know cut everything down so no butterfly comes but don't go out of your way to attract them but don't be upset because we can help so many other pollinators in the winter and they can concentrate on that you know the birds bees um you know beetles birds bees and beetles by leaving messy beds <laughs> and not cleaning everything up so that they have leaves to hide under or the bees have the stems to be in and you know we talk about that um but also when it gets warm again i have plenty of classes on butterfly gardening and you can either find it on my facebook page if phil would like to run that or on hernando county government youtube Okay, well, guys, it looks like it's a little bit beyond that time. So I think we're going to wrap it up for today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for tuning in. For anybody who is watching this broadcast after the fact, go back through the comments, find that link for taking our little short survey, click on it, and it's only five questions. I can't get, any, can't get much easier than that, five simple questions. So we appreciate it if you take that. Only take it once. Don't take it every time you watch a plant clinic. Just once. Okay. Otherwise, you'll confuse the heck out of my numbers. Mm -hmm. and other than that, I plan on being back here again next week. Lily, you got to be here? As far as I know, yeah. Okay, yeah, we'll be here. We'll try to get somebody else in here. Um, we need to get our new person from Mosquito Control. Yeah. yeah. Alyssa, that's her <clears throat> name. Yes. And Gabe? 
Elin, thank you so much for joining us and straightening out all of our water questions and confusion and everything else. Thanks for having us. And anybody feel free to reach out to us with any questions you all have. Okay, yeah, we're going to have to have you guys back on a regular basis though, because water is a very, very important topic. We try to cover it on a regular basis. So until next Thursday, thanks again, and we'll see you all then. Bye. Thank Bye. You.